So lesson six is on cause and effect. We're going to jump around a little bit. Um, one thing I want to mention though first is that when we did lesson one and two and even when we do lesson three, um, what we were looking at, this is just an example from lesson two, we were looking at one variable data. So we did this example with the mean playing times per game of 22 hockey players. So these are times that hockey players, uh, how many minutes they played. So the only variable we're looking at here is time. We're looking at playing time. So that is only one variable. As well, when we um, look at grouped data, we did that in lesson two as well. We had this table. And the table can be kind of de deceiving because it sort of looks like an x-axis and a y-axis, like a regular table of values. But this is a frequency table. We are saying that there, are, if we're using midpoints, uh, we're saying there's one 2.5 and there's six 12.5s. So what we're actually doing here is we're just talking about distance. So again, even though that looks like we have two variables, this is only about the distance that these turtles got in 15 minutes. Uh, distance in meters is our only one variable. So we're going to jump ahead to lesson six. And lesson six is now going to focus on uh, looking at two different variables. And uh, graphs like we're, we're used to seeing where we have an x-axis and a y-axis and we are able to plot those two variables on one graph. So we're looking at cause and effect. Usually when we graph a correlation, uh, we have a dependent variable, which is your y-axis, and an independent variable, which is your x-axis. And when we put two different variables on a graph like the one below, we're actually going to suggest when we, when we do this that this is for the number of um, successful free throws playing basketball out of 10 attempts. When we put this on a graph, we're suggesting that the more hours somebody practiced, the more baskets they're going to sink out of 10 uh, free throws. So one thing that we, we have kind of missed because we skipped ahead, there's this uh, number called a correlation coefficient, and we will talk about that more uh, when we look at lesson three. But having a high number here, um, it's basically the highest you can get is one is suggesting that these points are pretty close to the line. So we have a strong correlation here, which you might remember doing things like this in grade nine math, where you had a scatter plot and the teacher asked you to draw a line of best fit and you would just try and put a line between all the points the best that you could. So because these points sort of look like they're going up to the right, we would say we have a strong positive correlation here. So that might be familiar. What that is suggesting is that um, we have a relationship between the number of baskets uh, someone makes and the hours spent practicing. So most coaches would agree, I think this is reasonable that we're, we could say that the more you practice, the more baskets that you'll make. We can also look at a line of best fit. We'll look at that in lesson five. So a line of best fit though, y equals mx plus b. You probably remember this from uh, grade nine math. It's probably might've been a while, but we have a slope and a y-intercept. Our y-intercept looks like it's zero, our b. Um, and so our slope, if we pick a nice clear point, we could do rise over run, which is seven divided by five. We get a slope of 1.4. So our equation would look like y equals 1.4x. That line suggests that somebody would get um, zero successful free throws if they didn't practice, which I guess you could think is true. I mean, you could still not practice and just make baskets and uh, have good luck. Uh, this also is saying that we should get, this slope means um, for every one hour of practice, we would uh, get 1.4 baskets. So the more you practice, the more hours you practice, the more baskets you would make. Uh, this is a little weird because we only had 10 attempts. If we extended a line of best fit and we made it really long, that would suggest that, you know, if we practice for eight hours, maybe we would make 11 baskets, but we're only trying, uh, we're only doing 10 free throws here. 
So that would be an example of a cause and effect relationship. I think that the more hours you practice, the more baskets you would get. Sometimes though, there's a problem. If, if students just choose any two variables and they just plot them on a graph, what can happen is that the points actually can line up and suggest that you have a really strong correlation. Uh, you have to be very careful though with the variables you're choosing. So sometimes, for example here in example two, we could collect data. So a student just could go out and collect data on the number of robberies and in Canada, this is a StatCan uh, data table, and we could look at the automobile sales in Canada from 1988 to 1993. So this is kind of what students do for their final project. They collect these two variables. Um, they put number of robberies on the x-axis and automobile sales on the y-axis. And once you do that, you're suggesting that the number of robberies is going to actually cause a change in the automobile sales. So this looks like we are suggesting that an increase in robberies, so as the robberies went up, uh, the automobile sales went down. So we chose two variables that looks like a pretty strong correlation here. The points are really fairly close to the line of best fit. It's a negative correlation because the line is going down. But we just put these two variables on this graph and we can make a conclusion. Uh, the automobile sales depend on the number of robberies. Uh, this is our dependent variable up the y-axis. This doesn't make a lot of sense though, so think about that. Um, the more robberies we have, that is actually going to cause automobile sales to go down. So we can kind of think, okay, like in the, these years, what was going on here? So really, like what's happening? If the number of robberies go up, are enough people stealing cars that it's actually going to cause the automobile sales to go down in Canada? Like, do you think that's what's happening? And, and students come to conclusions based on the graph that they see. What is probably happening here though is that there's a third common cause that would be a factor. Uh, if we think about poor economic times, maybe high unemployment rate during the time from 1988 to 1993, we could kind of investigate that further. But if our economy was uh, going through a slump, that might cause the number of robberies to go up it also might be the cause of autom automobile sales going down. So in this case, you have to be careful what you put on a graph. I think there is a third variable here that is actually causing both of these two uh, situations to occur. So looking at the different types of relationships, what we really want is to find a cause and effect relationship. The correlation between two variables in which a change in one directly causes a change in the other. So for example, seatbelt infractions. The more um, seatbelt infractions, uh, that's going to cause more traffic fatalities. And you can kind of think there's a real direct relationship between seatbelt use and traffic fatalities. Common cause relationship is the one we just talked about. The correlation between two variables in which both variables change as a result of a third common variable. So for example, I like this one, Aiden discovers a strong linear correlation. He plotted uh, the number of forest fires and the yield of the tomato harvest. He is suggesting if he puts those two variables on a graph that they are related. Maybe there's more forest fires and therefore people are getting a lot of tomatoes. So you might think that sounds a little weird and there's probably this third common cause Perhaps these two items should not be the only two variables on a graph. I'm guessing it was a hot summer season that caused a lot of forest fires and that heat also caused uh, a high yield of tomatoes. Then we have a presumed relationship. So a relationship that makes sense but does not seem to have a causation factor. We assume a lot of things like for example, uh, we could say the number of uh, books that a child has in their home on the x-axis, that's actually going to cause their math scores to go up. We might assume that. Maybe uh, maybe they're, they're a good reader. Maybe they're a really good student. 
and having a lot of books um, means that they're going to have higher math scores. We could assume that. That's a presumed relationship. But I mean, we could also have a lot of really strong math students who do not have very many books in their home. And then a reverse cause and effect relationship. Um, it's actually when we make this cause and effect situation, but we actually might have it backwards. So a relationship in which the independent and dependent variables are reversed. So for example, consider the positive correlation between severe illness and depression. So we might think or hypothesize that being severely ill is very difficult and so it causes depression. And a researcher might come up with that hypothesis. However, really what is happening uh, is that depressed people um, struggle to take care of themselves. So the depression might actually cause someone to become severely ill. So sometimes we, we come up with this relationship and we actually have it completely backwards. Accidental relationship, this is kind of funny. Sometimes we plot anything on a graph. We have two variables. We put something on the x-axis and something on the y-axis, but they're not actually related at all. But wow, we have a really strong correlation and all the points are lining up really nicely. Uh, but it's purely accidental. So suppose that a positive correlation was found between a local kitten birth rate and the price of eggs. So you'd have these two different variables. You put them together on a graph and it would look like the more kittens there are uh, being born, the higher the price of eggs is at the store. Uh, this would be purely coincidental, although when you plot the points, you would see that there's this strong uh, correlation. And then example three, last thing, classify the relationships and justify your choice. What we're gonna do is, I know this is a little messy, we're going to look at the thing that's mentioned first, the variable patient stress would go on the y-axis and we have the exercise, for example, would go on the x-axis. So what I have in red there, because this is a little messy from before. So let's look at this. Negatively correlated means the line is going down. So the more that somebody exercises, the less stress they have. That seems to make sense. Many studies have shown that exercise can help decrease stress. So student math scores, uh, we would put the math scores on the y-axis and English scores on the x-axis. Positive correlation would mean the line is going up. The higher someone's English score, that's actually going to cause the math score to go up. That sounds a little fishy, right? It doesn't sound right. That would be a common cause relationship. Perhaps somebody who studies really hard, they're really good students, um, they're going to do well in English, but they'll also do well in math. Pancake sales are negatively correlated with the amount of rainfall. So the line is going down. The more rainfall we have um, is actually going to cause pancake sales to go down. And it sounds weird. I think that's an accidental relationship. There's no clear connection between the amount of rainfall and pancake sales. Uh, the last couple here... Job interview success rate uh, is positively correlated with the number of years a person has been married. So let's say you've been married for 10 or 15 years, you're going to do better then, that's going to cause you to do better in a job interview. Uh, we would say that's a presumed relationship, a mature person, um, they have stable relationships, they are connected in a way but we can't really say that the years someone's been married is going to cause um, them to do better in a job interview. Some people are not married and they can do very well in job interviews. So that's uh, a presumed relationship. And the last one, charged crimes is positively correlated with the size of the police force. So if we look at the police force, um, the more police we have, the more there are in charged crimes. I guess there's a lot more police and that's going to uh, result in a lot more charges. This could be a reverse cause and effect. If we did this the exact opposite way, we could say when crimes increase, uh, more officers are hired. That seems to make more sense to me. So this could be a reverse cause and effect relationship where we actually had the two variables backwards.